So, so what made you come up with this topic? Well, I have to say that in my field, we are um, looking more and more at sources of threat that are up to date with how people work. Because as you know, the reasons why people break into or cause problems for and, and digital presence have to do with money, power, solving a problem, like a lot of times of tinkering, mm -hmm. or sowing chaos, right? So political things. And now that everybody's connected online, you have a huge opportunity for all of these avenues. And because we're socially, physically distant, you see there's an intersection of people's social media presence that's bleeding a lot from their professional presence to their personal presence. You can talk to the same kind of thing with um, personal networking, as in digital networking, and the, the house networks were never built to handle commercial traffic. House VPNs or private VPNs were never built to handle commercial traffic. I mean, working from home has been a concept for a long time, but people <laughs> in practice are still tied to an office space or an office network or an office presence, if you will. Mm -hmm. And now in unprecedented numbers, people are disconnected from each other physically. And so they're even more connected online. And so I started to think about, well, if I were a bad guy or girl, where would the money be? And that was sort of the start of this conversation. I, I brainstormed for quite a while. And then I decided to go to the most simplest forum that I could, which was telling a true story. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have a friend that something happened to and it affected her business. And the story was compelling because it's absolutely a microcosm for where we are right now and what can happen right now. And it's the perfect storm of social justice and all that comes with that good, bad or indifferent, no judgment. And the idea that social media is not the public square it is not protected by the same free speech and the impartialness one way or the other good better and different that the public square is and people are using social media as not only a platform but also a means and mechanism to punish people or to bring them to justice if you will mm -hmm. to do both and if you couple that with the anon anonymity that you can have or the illusion of anonymity that you can have and then the nuisance which can be dangerous which is doxing we're at a perfect storm of things we have all of the opportunity for someone with very little training and very few tools to cause much harm and so i wanted to tell a story about that because i think it's super important for people in our field for individuals looking at things through their own personal lens and also for businesses who maybe invest a lot of money in traditional penetration tests or even some red team operations that maybe take social engineering into account, but have they really looked at their social media presence as a source of risk? I don't think so. And so I wanted to share the way I've been thinking about it as a leader in my company's cybersecurity team and maybe other people who are smarter than I am and other people who are interested in the topic can help to further the conversation. Wow, yeah, that's with, with news stories like uh, TikTok um, or Strava, where these social platforms are giving away so much seemingly well, non non-important information but once you pull all the pieces together you can weave quite a quite an interesting story about someone facebook has 42 patents for taking information from you and data about you and your surroundings they look through your camera they listen to your voice this is a this is a listening device and if you have even one application on here that's from facebook it is passively taking your voice and passively looking through the camera and recording everything about you. It's even following your choices on different applications. And it's all patented and it's all licensed and it's all out there in the public forum. 
there is so much about your own physical presence online that many people don't realize. People don't realize that they have only an illusion of privacy if they have all of these things, like a Google phone. It's an expensive, a pixel, right? It's a great phone, decent camera, but everything's turned on. It's gathering all kinds of information about you in the background. It's tracking everywhere you go in, in your uh, in your web browsing. It's tracking your usage of applications. And by usage, it isn't just how long do you use it. It's what do you do with it? What topics are you talking about? What about Alexa? You have Alexa in your home and it is actually shipping all of your conversations back to some office. Yeah. Google yeah. has a new has a new thing where you can take advantage of encryption at in motion, but the Chinese have built those encryption chips. And by their own stated practice, China takes a copy of everything and has the decryption key. And so under the hood, the expectation is that our data might be sent to China or decrypted in place and then ready for someone to use a backdoor that's built in to look at it. I mean. We live in a strange time and it doesn't do for people to be scared or paranoid or shut themselves off from connecting to people, but it also doesn't do to be ignorant. And so today I just wanted to share a little sliver of that. Perfect. Well, we're, we're at time, so I'm going to let you uh, jump off into your story and I'll save the questions for the end. So anyone that has any questions along the way, submit them in the question form and I'll save them for Cynthia at the end, okay? Um, Cynthia, take it away. Thank you. Um, this is a bit of a strange forum because I can't actually see any of you, but I'm glad that you're here and listening and I hope that you'll get something out of my talk. Today, I wanted to talk about social butterflies. We are social by nature as a species. Not everybody is completely social, but as a species in general, we like to be connected to others. In this time, we are rather physically disconnected. And so even more, we are connected online through social media, through things like Zoom and web conferencing, and through other things like instant messenger. So I wanted to tell you a story that talks about some of those things and some things to keep in mind, especially during times like this. So let's talk about social butterflies, a connection story. Chapter one in this story is about my friend Jane. Jane is a hero at work. She keeps track of her boss and she is very highly placed. She has a position of influence and many people consider her a mentor and a leader. Well, another thing about Jane is that she is actually a pretty well-regarded minor superhero online too. She's considered an influencer and she has many, many followers. And as part of her influencer role, she considers herself to be a proponent for social justice. She often speaks and raises status of topics that she sees as important and shares them with her followers in the hopes that they too will be educated on social justice things. Well, one day, Joe Snuffy, who's a person she knows, says some pretty incendiary things. And she does not appreciate these incendiary things that he's saying because they're offensive to one or more of the social groups and the activist topics that she considers to be important to herself. So what does she do about it? Well, she goes to her followers online and the groups that she goes and is a member of, and she says, this is who this is. She shares his job and she calls them to take action for the things that he did to bring him to justice. Well, as a result, her many followers in the groups that they are of which they are members, called his work to fire him for justice, to fire him because he was a bad person, to fire him because he did things that they didn't agree with. They called his work. They, they put presence on the workplaces online sites and the customers of his workplace. And so predictably, he was fired. Well, now, Joe Snuffy has a lot of time on his hands. 
he also is pretty decent at Photoshop. And he takes a look at Jane's different social media sites on the hopes that she may have said something in the last however long she's had those sites that can be taken out of context. He finds years and years of her social media presence because she keeps her private site public. So with a little bit of searching and a little bit of photo manipulation, he's able to say that she said some pretty offensive things. And so he goes to his followers and a few highly radicalized sites online and says, she said all these things and she's a bad person. You need to take action. And from here is where he feels he can take his revenge. So of course, these activist groups see that this person said some pretty awful things and she's a pretty awful person. So they go to Jane's place of work, they go to her email, they go to the leaders of the organization and call them on the phone. And they post on the social media sites of this company. Further, since the employees of this company also hashtag the business on their personal media sites, they inundate the employees' public facing social media sites, their personal sites that happen to be on social media, as well as the customers of the organization for which Jane works. They call all of these folks to action. They call the company to task for employing a person that is a very terrible human being. And they call the customers saying, do you want to do business with a company that doesn't care about these issues and will hire somebody and maintain somebody who does all these terrible things? Well, predictably, my friend Jane was fired. So I ask you, was justice done? So with these things, with these actions, there are consequences. And so chapter two in the story of Jane is paying the price. When you boil it down, Joe Snuffy made some un inappropriate comments on social media and he was taken to task. But the way he was taken to task was because Jane bullied him and doxed him on social media and then he was harassed at his workplace. And then Joe turned around and did the same thing to Jane. Who's right? I don't know if either of them are right, but that's not really the point of this conversation. Jane, who's a friend of mine, and I talked about it, and her company spent more than $100,000 on this event. The event was five days. But during that five days, 10 people were used full time to scrub social media presence of the company, to respond to customers and employees' questions on the matter, to write to the social media organizations that posted the very threatening comments online towards Jane. And at the end of the day, I have to ask, as a person who works in a business in a cybersecurity role, how could the business have avoided impacts from this? We're going down by the numbers, do we need to care about this? Is this really a problem? Well, in this particular event, there were 10 full-time responders, not just the security incident response team that they had a part, but also the content management team, a social media team that went and had to scrub all of the physical social media presence of the company, the marketing team who had then had to craft a response to or an avoidance of responding to the mob. And then the executive team, several members of the executive staff were harmed by being inundated by comments and phone calls and customers giving them direct phone calls and emails. They had a lot to deal with. But what about the rest of the costs? Well, the company hired a crisis PR firm to handle the messaging. They had a customer service team that had to respond to hundreds of calls and hundreds of, of problem tickets there was customer loss because some customers did feel strongly about a company that would employ someone who put out these negative messages. And then all of those people had a day job that wasn't getting done. The calculable clock cost was over a hundred thousand, but what about the long-term price? The stock price could have gone down. They could have lost customers. They did in this case, they could have lost reputation. And your cyber insurance premium will increase when you have a cybersecurity event. And if you can believe it, these kind of events are considered cybersecurity events because they have impacts. So how do we get to happy endings? 
Well, I want us to look at this through a couple of lenses. As a person who consumes social media, we should look at things through an individual lens. What's our individual responsibility? Well, we have a responsibility and we have a choice in how private or how public our social presence is. We have a personal brand. And if you think that your presence on the internet doesn't give you a reputation one way or the other, I don't believe that's true. I believe that you as an individual are known as an amalgamation of how people see you and that's your brand. And how you see yourself is how, what, you know, the brand that you wish to be. So you have your private and public identities. I definitely recommend if you are a person who's an avid social media user, have a public brand that you keep as clean as possible, that you're very careful about what you post. And then for the things that you really want to keep among friends, keep it offline if you can, but if you cannot consider a private and private identity that's very locked down, that you go through the privacy settings on your social media and turn them off. All the things that would normally connect you to people that you don't know, anything that would allow you to post without vetting that post, turn all of that off because your personal private side should be as private as possible. And then is it really your content? If you put it on a social media site, social media isn't a public place. You don't own that content fully. You're giving another company license to use that content in a myriad of ways. You should probably know how that permission that you're giving affects you and your data. And then what about being hard? Social power, many of us have feelings about the, the events that are happening right now, and we want to share in the social discussion. Well, social power is equivalent to having to have social responsibility. The things that you say have weight and have consequences. So consider what you mean when you say justice should be done and consider the other side of it. Well, are you causing harm with this injustice that you are doing? And then of course, if you put it out on the internet, it's practically immortal. There are lots of memes out there about individuals who did something that they didn't realize would end up harming them for a long period of time. Don't be that guy or girl. Okay, and then what about a business lens? We should look at this through the lens of business. How do businesses use social media and why is that important? Well, today, especially right now, businesses reach their customers through social media because it's faster and people are on social media and then they can share in the networking capabilities of social media and reach even more than their directed audience. Marketing campaigns should be really circumspect about using employees of a company as part of the campaign. Employee networking, it's great, but it's not as free as you think. You are now tied to that employee's points of view, and that employee is now tied to anything that happens at the business. As a business, you should be circumspect about doing that because, well, now you're putting both yourself and your employee at potential risk. And then what about blogs, forums, and press releases? Absolutely, businesses should take advantage of them, and they should have a message, but you should make sure that you know who you're reaching with your message. And so I, I like this term that I learned a long time ago, which was trust and verify. So have a content management team. Don't form it out to people that don't know you. Set ground rules and share them. Be respectful, but be firm. Make sure that you give people compassionate instruction on safe sharing online and help them to protect their personal brand because their personal brand can affect your business. And then have your incident response team rehearse and practice these sorts of social media campaign bio things that can happen because the social consequences i'm saying social a lot i realize that but that's sort of the point the consequences of our social presence can create incidents for the company and a business isn't complete unless they practice to be prepared to be resilient against the consequences of these events well what about the red teams what about testing what about firms that want to help give a company peace of mind. Is it possible? Well, I would say with a traditional pen test, it's probably not possible because it's locked down, it's repeated, it's got sort of check mark um, and very valuable completionist testing. So a red team feels like a better choice for testing against this. But in a red team operation, there's a fine line between testing as if you're an attacker and causing harm. 
And it's difficult to test whether you can cause harm without actually doing some of the things that would cause harm. Well, there's some pretty sticky legal wickets about what you can and can't do when you're impersonating sites. So just know what the rules are and be creative. You can probably measure the indicators of vulnerability and you can probably measure the connectedness of a company and you can probably grab an overwhelming amount of details that leads you to believe and be able to show on a continuum whether a business is somewhat vulnerable or somewhat resilient. Take a look at their employee handbook. Does the employee handbook mention social responsibility when posting things online? Does the marketing team use the employees as part of campaigns and are they read in on ways to keep those campaigns safe or the kinds of data that shouldn't be shared on those campaigns? Can you understand and learn a lot about the company just by looking at the employees' social media pages and vice versa? Can you look at the business's social media site, hashtag it on social media and find a bunch of their customers and a bunch of their employees? These sort of details can give you a great insight into how a company works and their resilience to these kinds of effects online. And so as we're thinking about these things and looking through these lenses, each one of us should ask ourselves, what role do we play individually and how can we make it better? I think it's naive to think that another team is responsible for our safety and security these days because we're sitting at home on our personal network, on our personal and professional systems, oftentimes blurring the lines between the two, maybe or maybe not using a VPN provided by the office, maybe or maybe not mixing our personal lives through the lens of our camera where you can see a person's kitchen or their family or their pets. We're sharing a lot of ourselves with each other right now. And so I think we each have an individual responsibility as well as a responsibility to those who work for us and with us to be resilient to bad things happening and to prevent or limit as much as possible our exposure, even though our sole connection is through the camera and through the digital realm. And so I will leave you with a parting thought that the way to manage the butterfly effect is to understand and adapt to our environments as they adapt around us. And with that, I'll keep it open for questions. Thank you for listening. Wow, that, that was very powerful. Um, you, you're right. Um, <laughs> that that that's that's a very interesting story because so many so many people don't think of their digital trail. I'm going to I'm going to leave it like that. Um, and the reason that I use that word or that phrase, it, it comes from a child story actually. Um, describing to a child what imprint they leave on the internet. And the way they described it is someone's digital tale. And I, I think it's a great way to describe it, even for adults. They don't think about everything that they do, the impact that it leaves behind them, and whether that could be a good impact or a bad impact. Um, but wow, that, that, that's spot on. Um, what do you think are some of the things that people can do to better control other than the, the hints that you gave um, while still trying to be social and um, and engaging with their, their peers, but control that access? Well, one of the things is take a look at the defaults. What is allowed by default on your social media presence? And I think many people will be surprised. There are dozens of privacy settings on some of the more established social media sites that will share by default or allow friends of friends to see you or see your posts or share your posts. And really, if you're going to have a little bit more control, there are options to be asked first. If you don't want to say no, just say ask me first, and then you'll be made aware when something's about to be shared or a link's going to come back to you. It's a start. Do you feel that, um, I, I know at least on the iPhone, when, when every app asks for something, um, do you feel people get alert fatigue, similar to how SOC analysts might get alert fatigue and eventually they just keep clicking yes all the time? 
Well, I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in, in employees where every time some change has to come to their phone from their work, you get a, you get words you don't understand and then click yes. And so how many people have like learned not to like read and understand the words, but they're like, yeah, yeah, it's just work doing another thing. It happens. And I would say, stop, take a second and ask, does this seem right? If the answer is no, or I don't know, consider not clicking yes. Have you ever um, recommended to your clients or your friends to, to do that review, to go back on their phone, to go back in their social every once in a while and, and reanalyze whether those settings are still relevant for where they are in their life? Um, I, I know for, once you have a phone that's anywhere over one year old, you might have 30, 40 different apps that you don't use or you haven't used in months. Do you really still need those apps? Do you still need those accounts? Um, go back and, and clean those up. I actually describe it to some of my friends and my mom as spring cleaning or fall cleaning. And a couple of times a year or well, every couple of months in my mom's case, I'll, I'll help them or I'll ask them or remind them to go through all of the things that they have on their computers and on their phone and just declutter as well as check the privacy settings that are in the phones, in the phone's general ledger, because those change over time. And even if you are fine with the way that they were, the way that they were may not be the way that they are. And it's good to check from time to time. And especially if the if the phone makes a major upgrade to the operating system, a lot of times the factory defaults can be reset. Definitely, definitely. And would you recommend for someone that's really privacy conscious to maybe uh, reset their phones to to factory defaults every once in a while to um, to root out any unwanted programs or any unwanted permissions um, that might have grown in since they, they last did that? If someone is very privacy conscious, an exceptionally private person, I would actually encourage them not to have any apps on their phone that broadcast outward, to have a phone-based firewall so that they can see what is being transmitted outward. And it creates performance challenges on the phone. Uh, so when they do something like that, it's usually for a short period of time. And then the other thing I recommend is getting a Faraday bag so that you can prevent any inbound or outbound communications from the device should you not want them. Of course, that means you can't get called on your phone, but if you're really seriously privacy conscious, you might want to guard or protect that time that you can be called. Definitely. Um, wow, great tips. Um, well, <clears throat> as we wrap up, um, reminder that the uh, closing GrimCon closing panel will be a chief information security panel moderated by our own Brian DeMuth, and that will be over in track one. Um, I will have, if you haven't registered um, for track one and you would like to see that closing panel, I will be sharing the link to register for track one so that you can see it. And I will paste that in the chat for everyone to see. Um, Feel free to jump on the Discord, ask any questions that you may have there, and um, have a great rest of your day. Cynthia, thank you so much for um, volunteering your time and putting on this amazing performance. Um, I, I really loved it. I learned a lot. Um, as much as I thought I knew, I still learn some, something every day. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thank you all in the audience for listening. Bye now. Bye.